Arrow.net. That's where you go when you want all of the conversations. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E dot net. All right, let's do it. Let's play it forward. These are real people, real stories. The struggle to play it forward. Episode number 520 is with Philip Winters of Tyrant. Where's the tour bus got you today? Uh, we're at home. Well, I'm at home. The other guys are most likely working right now. <laughs> well, you're at home. That means you're working, too. I bet you got some things to do. Yeah, I'm actually... Uh, Putting together some cassette artwork that we're going to uh, hopefully order this week. Some cassette copies, some super limited edition cassette copies of the, the new album. That's so funny that you say that because I was with the people at that on NBC's The Voice today, and, and we talked a lot about cassettes. So, and then, so to hear you continue that conversation, I mean, th- mm-hmm. I got to be honest with you, the younger generation says, yeah, I want some of that action. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's strange because I remember, you know, when I was really young and I would listen to my dad's cassette collection and then I I saw the progression between, you know, like when I was a kid really getting into music, you know, CDs were the big thing. But my dad is being older, you know, still had some of his old cassettes. And I remember watching CDs turn into, you know, pirating music on like uh, LimeWire and then, you know, iTunes and then. It went to streaming and now it's vinyl and it's been vinyl for the past eight years. And now it's cassettes like they just sprung up out of nowhere in the past year or two. Yeah, because I, I, I have so many cassettes. And what I, what I did was I bought a, uh, a a digital device that helps me transfer it all over into, uh, you know, into the digital world and stuff like that. Yeah. And it says, but you're right, though. And the quality, there was always a quality about that cassette. As long as you kept it out of the sunshine, that cassette would last forever. Yeah. I mean, with with the technology today, you know, they have like I think it's like ferro metal tape or whatever, which mm-hmm. prevents degradation. So they, you know, they can stay really nice for a long time. Boy, boy that the, the poor dashboard of a car, man. I mean, oh my god, we got to go get <laughs> we got to get a cassette deck now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> putting this this collection of music together, the the lowest level. What what is it that that you learned from it? Because every time you go into the studio, it's a new exploration. So one of the big takeaways for for all of us is we we self-produced this album, which is something we haven't done before. But uh, we not only did we learn a lot about, you know, producing music, whether it's it's microphone placement or, you know, whatever the case may be. um, We also really kind of spent a lot of time just perfecting the songs about as well as they they could be. You know, obviously nothing's ever perfect, (laughs) but. Um, you know, we, there's one song that we rewrote and rewrote the bridge maybe six different times. And, uh, you know, we really kind of just dove headfirst in, into what we could do to make the song better. Did you, uh, when, when it came to the song, uh, the sun, the moon and the, and, and the truth, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a deep meaning to this song. I mean, if, if people sit back and really listen to the lyrics of this, you're going to, you know, they're, they're going to experience their own interpretation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorites too. And, and, you know, going off the lyrics, we, I try not to write, uh, too vague that it's unrelatable, but I try not to be too obvious that the meanings, you know, like right in your face and there's no other interpretation, but, uh, you know, every, you know, we want to, we kind of want to leave it open-ended, you know, like s- songs like uh, like Sins and I Master, they're a little bit more on the nose. But Sun, you know, you know, still has kind of like this poetic, vague, um, you know, meaning and, and it and allows for interpretation. Speaking of meanings, how about that album cover, man? I mean, what what went into that? Because it was it was a, it wasn't done by the first time. I mean, you guys had to have you know crafted that to put it together. Yeah, so the guy who did the artwork, his name's Daniel Porta. He does a lot of work for, um, you know, traditional heavy metal bands, bands within the similar style we are. Um, he does work for like Haunt and Unto Others and, and Silvertown, like a bunch of other bands. Um, but we pretty much, we, Andrew and I, the drummer, we uh, had kind of brainstormed some some ideas about album artwork, and we were th- thinking about doing it ourselves, but we kind of wanted to let somebody else interpret yep. our vision. Yep. So we, we typed out all of the song titles and, and gave brief brief synopsis of, of what we were thinking for each uh, song and, and the track listing. And we kind of just let him have at it. And he pulled 
a little bit from each song and kind of made like this amalgamation of, of everything that is in the album. You know what I'm saying? I do. I do. And, uh, yeah. So we kind of let him have his, you know, creative freedom. You know, we tweaked it here and there, but you know, the first iteration is pretty close to what the final al- album artwork was. Well, the way it's always been so. is that the album cover, it, it goes right along with the music. I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't know how many times I sat there on my bed, just staring at that album cover while listening to songs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm a big vinyl guy too. Uh, so I love being able to like hold the album and, and look at the artwork and read the lyrics yep. while I'm listening to it. You know, it's a, it's a whole experience. Have we redefined what metal is or great rock is? And, and the reason why I bring that up is because it, it seems like that, that every generation now is calling it their own. I think there's a lot of really great innovation happening with, with metal. And, you know, it's, I think it's just because of the, the accessibility of music nowadays, mm-hmm. you know, we live in the 21st century and you can hear, hundred different bands in, in an hour, you know what I'm saying? Just whether it's through streaming platforms or whatever. So like all these different bands kind of, you know, I, I pull influences from, you know, artists I like a lot of them aren't even metal bands. You know what I'm saying? I listen to like a lot of prog rock, yeah. uh, yeah. Andrew and I, we listen to a lot of like hip hop. Um, you know, Sal is our bass player is a big death metal guy. Chuck's really into like symphonic, like orchestral stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, we all kind of pull it into different places and, and I know this is a long winded answer to your question, but you know, there's a lot of bands I've seen, and this isn't a judgment, but they kind of recreate the magic that was the eighties and nineties, you know, and, uh, but it it kind of falls flat because it's, it's been done. It's, it's heard, it's predictable. Um, so some of the metal bands I really like, they take what is familiar and put their own brand on it, you know, and their own trademark. Well, your trademark, those guitars, because you, you look at that song sins uh, of the many. And I mean, those, those twin guitars, man, I mean, you layer them so perfectly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we try to, you know, obviously we're, we're just four dudes, but we try to create as much musical, um, and composition as possible because like even Sal, when he's on some of his bass parts, he's not following the rhythm guitar, you know, he's kind of doing, you know, his own, his own lines and he's filling in gaps where the guitars are just, you know, chugging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, long intros. That's, that's the thing that really caught my attention on this one is I, I mean, you guys have got some long intros. I mean, there for a while there were there, you know, a lot of these bands were doing no intros and it's like, no, 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 you got, you got to get this song into my heart before you start taking off. Yeah. Um, we, you know, it's funny as we tried to, to stay away from some of the longer intros. I think it kind of just happened naturally like world stone, you know, we've got that minute, minute and a half long intro. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's an album opener, but like with pray for the night, you know, we're in it in, in 30 seconds, you know, we, we try to, and I know this is kind of a silly adage, but we try to kind of stick to the, as much as we can to the, don't bore us, get to the chorus. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah well, which is, is, that, that's so interesting that you say that because in my notes, I, I, I said it hit me hard. You didn't waste any time making your presence known. Yeah. The, the, I yeah, mean, I'm, you jump on that thing big time on that song. Yeah. Pray for the night. Yeah. yeah we, we really wanted to. And, you know, pray for the night we chose as the lead single because it kind of is the most accessible and it's got a little bit of everything. You know, it's got like really heavy guitar riffs in the intro and you know, it's fast, it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's kind of brooding, you know, emotional. And, uh, but the, but the chorus is, is big in my opinion. And, you know, pretty much everybody could sing that. And that's, yeah. that was kind of the point is to, to, to make it catchy and, and make a really good hook. And hopefully, hopefully we accomplish that. Yeah, it seems I, like I'm thinking it's on your set list, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It would have to be. But yeah, but do you have to sit there and argue with each other about the way it's like, okay, do we go three quarters of the way into the show before we let them have it? Do we do it in the front so we can ignite them? What, what, what are you going to do? So for set list, um, typically when we're on tour, we play the same set list every night just mm-hmm. so it, it, uh, it kind of gets tighter and tighter as we go. Um, but we always try to keep our set list kind of like 
you know, like peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. So we'll start off with like a, you know, we'll start off strong and then we'll get even stronger and then we'll kind of bring it back down, you know, in terms of like tempo and, and feel. And we also try to, um, same with the album too. We try not to, to pair songs back to back if they're in the same key, Mm -hmm. um, which I, I know metal specifically has a classic trope of being written in E minor. So that's another thing we kind of take into consideration. You know, maybe we play a song in D minor here to start and then we go elsewhere just so it it kind of breaks up the set and doesn't feel like you're listening to one long song, you know? I do know the and one one of the things that that when you when you talk about the energy and the tempo and stuff like that you you jump right away I'm starting to think of the song of Ash because the the, the song you don't need a Red Bull with this one and I mean is it, I, mean, yeah. I mean it really takes off yeah um, and that a lot of that that energy and uh, you know as Andrew describes it, it it's like a locomotive that just won't stop <laughs> right you know it's just, it just goes the entire time and that was that was a, a big influence from andrew you know he's like let's just let's just make it go and that's why he's like constant double bass the whole song but yeah i mean that that song goes that one's a really fun one to play live it goes over well live yeah but how do you guys catch your breath after you play a song like that i mean you're back there sucking on oxygen right after it (laughs) yeah well (laughs) it's uh it's definitely you know it's a learning curve to to sing and play at the same time but it's all about like controlling, you know, your, uh, your, your oxygen yep. output, I guess, just yep. so I don't pass out on stage. I know the other guys, they just go full bore the entire time. Um, but as, as the vocalist, I kind of do have to, uh, you know, conserve my air and energies just so I don't get winded. <laughs> right. <laughs> with, with the song, uh, world St- uh, stone. I mean, you guys fade into that song. And so that caught my attention as a creative person in the way that it's like, okay, I'm walking into this song as it begins. Yeah. And it, and it was kind of, it, it's meant to be, obviously the intro is meant to be very atmospheric and just kind of slowly like you know like you said walk into it and and kind of slowly op- like open the the gate metaphorical gate if you will into into the album and you know just and then it, and then it just takes off yeah um but yeah do you find yourself going on a a more national tour or anything like that or what do you guys got planned um right now the the tentative plan is to do a full US tour sometime next year nice uh, we don't have anything set in stone yet. We're kind of planning it still. Um, cause we, we still do a lot of stuff ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm the main tour booking guy. That's what I do for my, my job is I book tours. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I do all the tours and, and we're planning a full U S one. Um, and hopefully, uh, we can get some decent support tours because, you know, the headline tours are fun. But we really, really need to, you know, reach into a, a, a larger audience. Absolutely. I mean, does that put you on college campuses and do the old Dave Matthews thing? <laughs> uh, no, but surprisingly, we've done a lot of college radio interviews. We nice. haven't played a, an official college campus yet. I mean, I guess you could get, consider East Lansing, Lansing, yeah. a college campus, you know, with Michigan State University. But, you know, we haven't. I don't think we've played a true college campus yet. <laughs> and on the song, the, the, the final song of the, of the album, um, Call of the Void, I, it's one of those songs where the one thing that, it, 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 for me to even hit repeat, I wanted to experience this and take 10 seconds to just breathe. Because it's almost like, mm-hmm. it, it's like you guys said, okay, that was the experience. Let's do it again. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, it's, it's funny because that, that whole song. And I, I mean, like the lyrics on that one are, are pretty on the nose too, but it's, it's a lot about like the cycle of life, you know, life into death and death into life, so on and so forth. Right. But yeah, that one, that one's for me and, and Andrew as well, that one always gets to me like really emotionally. Um, and, and it's just something about the song that, I, I don't know. It just really <laughs> strikes me, you know, obviously, Andrew and I, like we all wrote it, but 
I don't know. It just gets to me every single time. See, that's what I like about music anyway, is the fact that, you know, as, as a creator of sound, I mean, it's like you take it so personal, but yet when you're relinquishing it to, to a live crowd, it's like, okay, it's ours, but it now belongs to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I going off that, I actually heard somebody say that in, I don't know, I was watching some interview or reading something the other day, but they said, you know, as an artist, when you're creating it, it's yours. But the moment you release it and put it out into the public domain, it's no longer yours. That's it. That's you know? it. And that's got to play hell on your heart because, I mean, all of, I mean, people are singing your song. They're taking it with them. They've made it a part of their life and things like that. And it's like, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I think it's incredibly gratifying, even if people hate hate the song. Yeah, they still listen to it. You know what I'm saying? And that's 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 ultimately what we want to do is you know, have people hear what we're creating. And if they like it, that's awesome. If not, you know, tell us why, what, what do you think? Like it's, it's art. It's meant to, to evoke some emotion, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and what's, what's fascinating when you, you were telling me that, uh, you, you know, you booked the tours and stuff like that. I, I like this page in music history because it's, it, you know, during the, the 80s and 90s, it was all, uh, all about the record companies and all that kind of stuff, putting you guys out there. And you guys didn't have the control that you have now. I mean, I mean you're probably doing your own merch right now. You're doing everything. Yep. And that, to me, puts more passion or more investment in your product. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not only that, but there's, there's less hands in the cookie jar. Yep. You know, we... we we design all of our own merch. We press all of our own merch. Um, we run our own web store and all that stuff. So like supporting the band has never been more lucrative in the 21st century. Whereas, you know, talking about the, the early days of the industry, when you had all these record label executives, you know, taking their cut of the revenue on the way down and then the bands left with, with crumbs, Yep. you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, costs a lot more time, but we can, we can be deliberate with our decisions and, you know, what type of merch we're putting out and, you know, we get, we get all of the money, Someone was which is me, huge. Somebody was telling me last week that you make the music because you need to get the performance. You get the performance to sell the merchandise. And so, so it's like, yeah. you need that album first, but it wasn't like the old days where you were trying to sell the album and, but you want to sell everything else. Yeah. I mean, we're essentially, uh, traveling t-shirt salesman you know what i'm saying <laughs> so true. um you know what it is true with the with the resurgence of physical media like um like vinyl and cassettes you know there's a there's becoming an increasing way bands can make money off of the music mm-hmm. but you know a lot of people still stream and 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 you know listen to music digitally which is not really you know, it doesn't pay well, right. but being out on tour and, and meeting people face to face and establishing those connections, that is the most valuable thing, you know, because we can meet somebody at a show in in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and, and they're a fan for life. Yep. You know, they show up at every show. Um, they buy the CDs, they buy the vinyl, they buy the, the new merch drops, whatever. But that's really, you know, the valuable thing yeah. is is making fans yeah you where, know where can people go to find out more about the new album and get some of that merchandise we're talking about everything's at tyrantband.com that simple and, yeah. <laughs> that, that simple we, we make it so simple <laughs> all right man when you guys head back to the carolinas we got to get together and do a face-to-face conversation yeah, absolutely. All right. Man. We'd love to go back. We've been to North Carolina before. Yeah. Was, is, is it a different type of audience when you when you travel, let's say, from the south to maybe up around the New York area, and then, then you head out to California? Well, we haven't been all the way out to California. I think the furthest west we've been is, is Albuquerque. But, okay. yeah, I mean, there's definitely a difference. You know, a lot of the times when we do these tours, we, we kind of hit markets outside of, like, New York City. Mm-hmm. Um because, you know, in New York City, there's a million things to do. Yeah. You know, people don't want to go to some some metal show on a Thursday evening. Um, but like in, you know, we played St. Louis and I think we did like 40 people on a Sunday. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's weird to see these little pockets of like metal fandom. You know, it, it seems like the South... And, and Southwest is really into metal. Yeah. yeah. And like the, the Pacific Northwest, you know, the East Coast is, 
um i mean they like metal but it it doesn't seem as popular. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, and it's helping that these classic rock radio stations are finally embracing new rock and they're calling it second generation classic rock. I mean, if that's what you have to do is change the title still, it opens up the door for yeah. bands like yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, dude, come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to come back, man. Excellent. I appreciate it. You'd be brilliant today. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You as well, man.